Happy Friday, everybody. And if it's not Friday for you, I am so sorry, but today is Friday for me and the vibes are insane right now. Vibes are insane. Hey, I hope everybody had a good week. Today I'm gonna to be doing a breakdown of an edit that I did for Joe again, where he is comparing um, two different games. So it's gonna be a hybrid blend of gameplay editing along with highlighting the talking points. Um, so hope you guys enjoy the video. This is gonna be one of the first times I'm actually recording in the afternoon, so <laughs> I won't be whispering during the video. Uh, and let's hop into the actual edit. So what you guys are gonna be watching in the background as I'm talking about how I structure this video is the uh, opening sequence that I did. And um, what Joe says in the background is, we need to have a talk, no, not that talk. And so the way I'm gonna try to frame it is a quick little riff on the birds and the bees talk. And I went through a process of trying to figure out the best way to illustrate that and a funny way to illustrate that. And it ended up, I think, taking me more time than I wanted. And I tried to cut out a lot of the dead space in that process. So I think what I end up showing is the final way I go about doing it. And I use this video of this kid <laughs> kind of being scared of what's being said to him. And I try to come up with an animation. I felt like the final result came out okay. Um, I think if I had more time to animate or illustrate something, um, I would have done that. But again, I'm using uh, Play Phrase, and if you've never used this website, it's really handy. You can type in any kind of dialogue or text, and it will search through a library of film to find an actor saying those lines, which is super useful. And I think I'm trying to just find some, some sound effects right now is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to to make this sequence a little more funny. So um, the video itself is, like I mentioned, it's Joe, the creator, him breaking down his essentially a review of two games. There's Warzone 1 and Warzone 2. So Warzone 2 is the sequel. It's the most recent game. And right now in the COD scene, it's kind of a debated subject about whether or not um, Warzone 1 or Warzone 2 is better. And this graphic you're seeing is something I made in Photoshop. Uh, this, I should have gone back and fixed it so that the dialogue line looked like it was actually coming from the person, but I was already behind on the video, so I said, we'll, we'll just use this. Um, so he's going to be doing a breakdown of the two games, and what he had sent me over is one talking sequence where he had some notes as to what what he liked about each game, and what he didn't like, and then we tried to break it down into four sections. So him talking about the the maps in the game and the guns in the game and other factors, et cetera, et cetera. And so what he sent me over was one video file, and that was it. So my job for this video is to take that talking head video file and try to illustrate the points that he's making because if you don't do that, essentially what the video is, is one long continuous shot of Joe talking to the camera, which can work in some scenarios, but it's gonna be much better if I illustrate those points in DaVinci. So that's gonna be my job, that's my ideology for this video is, I'm taking what Joe is saying, and then I'm either looking for gameplay that will illustrate what he's saying, or I'm gonna try to find some title sequences that I can use to highlight a certain section, or if he's saying something important, we add subtitles. Basically, we're highlighting what he's saying and um, trying to cut out as well any of the excess of the video. I think Joe talking through this video, I think the file he sent over was around 30 minutes and we ended up cutting down the video to, I believe, 14 minutes. And I the bulk of that process, I didn't include here. So it looks like I didn't include the, the color grading process as well because I had done that. I think we did um, my color process or my color grading in uh, the previous unedited edit. Uh, I can show it again in a future video if we need to. But right now what you're watching is me trying to mask out Joe for uh, one of the animations that I use, and 
Um, I have various luck with masking things in DaVinci. And I think I've said this before, but I really just need to watch a tutorial on how to do it well. I think it's set up to be pretty powerful. And I've kind of just <laughs> like I figured it out as, as I've gone along. So I, I've drawn a line over Joe to track him. And then I have a line on the mic to include that as well. And I think later on, I draw subtract lines to get rid of some of the, the black space. But this is a feature you have to use in the studio version of, excuse me, the studio version of DaVinci. So if you're using the free version, unfortunately, you can't use the magic mask options. Uh, you still can do some masking, but it's a lot more manual of a process. So you can see I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the best way of going about doing this. Do I mask his hands individually? Do I just draw one line? I don't know. So I'm trying to figure that out right now. And that is because I'm going to slide Just Joe over the background. And if you are a content creator and you like to do some more fun things with your editing, it helps to have a solid clean plate background or some kind of contrast to your body. Because the issue that I'm having right now, and you got a quick glimpse of the sections that I cut up, the issues that you're seeing right now is um, Joe's skin tone is very similar to the couches behind him and the carpet, and his shirt is black, which kind of matches the blanket to the left and the, the floor. So Da Vinci's doing a pretty good job of separating him. Um, I think there's a little bit of focus contrast that's able to pick up, and I, I've got a good line right there, so that works pretty well. And that's what I'm going to use to highlight over it, because in this this sequence, he says, um, we need to have a talk. No, not that talk. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the little therapist scene talking to the kid with the birds and the bees. And then when he says, no, not that talk, he slides onto the screen. So that's, that's the process I'm going through right now. And one thing that I've actually found to work better in DaVinci Resolve is the object tracking versus the person tracking if you look on that window it's on the screen right now there's um, two little icons in the top right of your magic mask there's an object tracker and a person tracker and with the person tracker you can choose to highlight either like a single body or you can look for p uh, uh, parts of the person so like face hair arms etc and i honestly have better luck just using the object tracker it seems to pick up continuous things better than if I use the uh, the people person tracker. <laughs> I hope that's actually the right name, I don't know. So that's what I end up using and I have a, a much cleaner, better result. And then I nest that because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add that transform effect that I like to use to slide it onto the screen. And that's because again, I, I like the motion blur, man. I, I've, been, I've been enjoying the luxuries of motion blur. <laughs> that's what I use. And if you if you apply the transform node on the um, the clip itself without nesting it, what you're gonna do is you're gonna move the clip underneath the color grade, if that makes sense. So you're gonna be um, affecting it before that color grade and that mask is applied and it's gonna mess it up. So. If you're gonna do anything with your mask or your grade or whatever you're doing in that color page in the edit page before it reaches the coloring, I would recommend nesting it. That's gonna be Brandon's recommendation of the day. So we're still working through this intro sequence. Um, something else that I wanna mention and I, I'm assuming I'm gonna start getting into it more as this edit comes along is I really tried to focus on my sound design in this video. And the version that you see in this cut, I don't think ends up being the final cut, but it's pretty close because I had to stop recording or I stopped recording because I had already been recording for a while and I knew it was going to be a lot for me to talk over. But I had recently watched this video from, I believe the channel is Standard Story Company. It's um, 
Yes, it is. I just looked it up. It is Standard Story Company. And the gentleman who's in charge of that channel focuses on how to edit better. And he, it seems like his background is in short film, so obviously not gaming. But he put out a video on how he does sound design for his trailers. And he actually doesn't use a lot of, or excuse me, in the video, he doesn't use a lot of the actual mic recording, he adds in a lot of his own sound effects from uh, stock stock footage websites, and I think he uses a different one, but for mine. But it was just it was illuminating for how much you can do to improve the quality of an edit with sound effects, and it's something that I've been trying to learn more and more, and I felt like I was doing a good job, and then I watched his video and realized I was nowhere close to doing a good job. So that was the one thing that I felt like I wanted to incorporate in this video is better sound design. Every time I go through an edit, I if I have the time, obviously there's times when you don't have the time. Anytime I go through an edit and I have the time, I try to figure out something new that I can include. I think it's really important for content creators at my level and editors at my level who don't have an editing education or we don't have years of film experience to not settle with the basics. Because I think that gets you, it, it's good for starting you out, but if you really want to grow, you got, it, it's with, I mean, anything you do in life, right? If you want to get better at it, you got to practice and you, you got to try something new. You got to get a little uncomfortable, even in your editing. So this was the, uh, the one miracle I was going to apply for this video is sound design. And... I think what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to figure out how I'd like to do this next sequence. Um, and now that I'm, I'm watching this back, what I'm remembering is I knew I wanted to do a good bit of sound design. So before I got to it, I just wanted to get the pacing and the edit done first. I think I've mentioned it in the past, but um, I'll... A lot of editors that I've learned from from and watched really recommend not including your music or, again, sound design until you have the feel of the video finished, so like the actual edit finished, because the music can become a crutch for the video, and it can hurt what could be a better edit. So... Right now I'm just focusing on the actual cut of the video and the section that you're watching right now, Joe is talking about, today we're gonna be talking, He's or excuse me, he's saying today we're gonna be talking about Warzone 1 versus Warzone 2. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to slide him over from one side to the other depending on which game he's talking about. So you can see here I slide him to the left and then I slide them to the right. And I think what I end up doing is I keep that mask theme. Well, there's a word for that. Motif? Is that the word? When is, there's like a running thing that's happening. Isn't that motif? I don't know. I have a friend who always says, um, you know, I may not be smart, but I'm also stupid. And recently I've been, I've been feeling that a lot. You know, like I... Listen, I may not be the smartest, but I'm also a little dumb. You know what I mean? So yeah, that, I think that's what the process I'm starting right here. Yep. So I'm going to go ahead and compound all my color nodes, and then I'm going to try to mask them out again. And I immediately go to the object option instead of the, the person object because I've learned my lesson. And I'm looking for a frame that's got a pretty, pretty clean lineup of Joe. Oh yeah, and this one actually tracks pretty nice. And see, we gotta go with the object mode. The the person mode is not not the way to do things. Um, so yeah, uh, that's what I'm gonna be doing through this part right here. Um, and you'll see me kind of build it out. I'm gonna split up the clip. Yeah, that actually looks pretty good. Nice work, Brandon. 
I'm gonna split up the masked out sections um, depending on whether or not he's talking about Warzone 1 versus Warzone 2. And then I'm gonna be bringing in trailers for Warzone 1 versus Warzone 2 in the background. And this is another one of those parts that I think came out fine, but I didn't, I don't know how to make it better. When I watch really well put together videos, there's like a certain level of professionalism and quality and cleanliness that comes with those videos to where you can tell, you know, it's been like a, a well put together video. And I'm really trying to do that with each of the edits that I have going on. But I, sometimes I just don't know what to do for certain situations. And in those situations, when I don't know what to look up or I don't know who to reference, I kind of just go with my best guess, my best intuition for, okay, maybe this would look fine. And it's where experience comes into play and things that you've done in the past and using your tool belt to make something look good. Um, but yeah, I, this, this section in particular, I just, I don't know. I, I wanted to add some flair to him talking about Warzone one versus Warzone two that made it seem like this was going to be, this was going to be a fun video and not just Joe talking because Joe opens up the video was saying, you know, like, let's talk. And his channel is here. I'm grabbing the trailers. Um, <laughs> again, disclaimer, if you want to use uh, these websites to download things, use them at your own discretion. Uh, they probably install like a million tracking Trojans on your PC. Uh, so <laughs> use it at your own discretion. But Joe opens the video with talking about, you know, we're going to talk today. And as a viewer on Joe's channel, I'm probably coming in to expect to see gameplay. So when I don't see that immediately, as an editor, I'm thinking I need to provide them something, something with a little flair so they're thinking like, okay, make, maybe this will be a fun video to watch. So that's what I'm trying to do really hard in this opening sequence is just add that that value to the video so that um, people will stick around and watch uh, the video. And would you look at that? We are almost 18 minutes in the video. Look at you guys go. Just listening and learning and editing away. Uh, I for real do appreciate you guys watching these videos. Um, the last one that I did seemed to get a good amount of love. So I, I'm glad um, y'all are finding it useful. Uh, question for you guys, if you've made it this far, is there a particular kind of video that would be useful for me to do one of these for? Um, I should, before this one goes live, I should be putting out a actual tutorial video and I'm gonna start putting out more of those videos to help with specific things. But is there a particular video that you enjoy watching with these sort of things? Like are the gameplay edits useful because I do those a lot or um, I think I had mentioned doing like a short form type of video so you know like a TikTok or a YouTube short or I, we don't do vlogs all that much but you know like a montage let me know let me know if there is something in particular that uh, would be useful for me to do one of these for but back in Da Vinci land um I'm overlaying the mask on the COD trailers. And you'll see one of the issues that I'm having right now is that the adjustment layer that I'm using to move Joe side to side is also adjusting the trailers. And the issue with it doing that is that I believe the adjustment layer has a zoom on it maybe okay it might have a zoom but when you use the open effects transform on your clip it's it will shift the frame itself so it won't shift 
the full width and height of the video. So say I had a 1440p video and I moved it or I, I zoomed in to two times that value, right? So we're, we're zoomed in pretty tight. If I use the open effects transform node or transform effect, excuse me, and I shift the position with the transform node, then it's actually going to show a black border, even though there's more of the video that we're not seeing, if that makes sense. It, and if you're in DaVinci and you've played around with it before, you know what I'm talking about. So that's the issue that I'm, I'm encountering right now. And I think the workaround that I had was that I just didn't move Joe and the whole frame as far left and as far right. So before I had him like really shift to like the left third and the right third of the video. And now I kind of just, yeah, you can see all I do is move them to the left a little bit and to the right a little. So, oh, and that's what, that's the other thing that I do is instead of having just the videos uh, in the background that pop on, I animate the crop so it kind of slides into the frame. So you can see you can see the Warzone 2 trailer sliding into the frame and the Warzone 1 trailer sliding out. And that's just a keyframe on the crop property. I have the Warzone 1 and Warzone 2 logos um, popping on as well. Just a little added value. If you ever have trouble grabbing uh, graphic assets for your videos, there's a couple websites that you can use if you don't have Photoshop that will remove the backgrounds for you. And if you one I believe is it's remove bg or remove dot bg, but if you do a Google search for remove background, um, you, there's like a there's a bunch of tools that you can use to help you remove backgrounds. Um, I would have liked, and I don't know why I didn't fix this in Photoshop, but um, I use an invert color tool to flip the logo to white. I don't know why it came in as black unless was it black in the I can't remember was it black in the image I downloaded but this becomes an issue later on because what I do in a, another sequence is Joe's like today we're going to be talking about Warzone 1 versus Warzone 2 um, where I'm going to be doing my best to break it down into these four sections so that we can talk about what's good and what's bad about the game and then he says all right let's discuss Warzone 1 Warzone 2 and when he does that I track the logos onto his hands because he brings up his hands in like a scale kind of fashion. Um, so I'm revisiting the intro here. Replaying it to see how everything flows. And I think this is pretty close to being the final visuals for it. We have the therapist scene, Joe sliding onto the screen, and then he's, um, him cu cutting back to him. And then we do the trailer thing. One thing again that I could talk about um, that helped with this video. And I'll, would you would you look at that timing? So I zoomed out on my timeline real quick. And you can kind of see it. And I glance at it from time to time. I did some organizing with his, um, his talking points. Because like I've mentioned, there's four sections. So the first thing I did, and I didn't show it just because I, there wasn't much to talk about besides me just saying I cut up the video. But one of the first things that I did is I played his talking section all the way through, which is something you should do with all of your videos. Even if you're, even if it's your video and you know what you said, um, giving every bit of your footage a full listen through, if you, if you don't do that, you're either missing things that could be included or you're going to keep in things that probably don't need to be included and then you have to go back and fix them later on and when you ever whenever you watch people go through and do editing editing videos and tutorials that's one thing that i picked up on people doing they'll have like a starting timeline with the uncut footage and then they might even have like a secondary timeline where it's like a cleaned up version and they might even have like a third timeline where they take the cleaned up version and they refine it down to like just the uh, just the nuggets. Just the, I was gonna say juicy nuggets, but that's kind of odd. I don't know if nuggets can be juicy. Um, so right now, what I'm doing is I'm going through my backed up videos and I'm trying to find some gameplays because I know 
Joe is going to be talking about certain things within the gameplays. So what I'm doing is I'm um, finding some games that I feel like will be useful later on. And I actually add some in as we go along. But this is a good reason to back up your footage. And I, <laughs> Marcus, if you're listening to this at this point, stop deleting your videos. Stop. Stop deleting your videos. Back them up. Get a hard drive. Back up your videos because you will never know when you need to use them again. So don't delete your videos. That's a bad idea. Back everything up. Um, back everything up. Guns, like you know what you're doing. You know what I mean? Um, and here I start overlaying some of the gameplays. And for the gameplays themselves, what I do is I add in a, um, I guess you could call it a sliding transition, but I think I manually keyframe it. And what you do is you add your transform node, you start at the first frame of the video and then jump ahead like six, seven, eight frames if you're operating in 60 FPS and frame it again and then, or frame it again, add a keyframe and then jump back to the video at the beginning point and either slide it to the left or slide it down up to the right, whichever way you'd like to slide it in from and move it off of the screen. And then when you play it, it'll start off the screen and animate on screen. And if you add some good old motion blur, it looks insane. Looks insane. Well, what I was saying is, um, something that really helped this video is me, and you can kind of see, I just showed, yeah, there we go, there's the timeline. Nice work, Brandon. So I, I, I had already done my fine tuning for the video. And if you look at the top left, I think it's still close to like 20 minutes and we refine it down from there. Like I still do some refining as the video goes along. And um, I actually do some, some good old color coordination and I give the clips color based on the talking points. And I felt like that was actually something that really helped. Oh, here's something that is kind of nice to talk about. This is Joe's brand guide, and I think I'm fine with showing this. I, I don't think, well, <clears throat> nah, this should be fine. So uh, when, Joe, when Joe did his big rebrand, one of the things that he got done for him was a brand guideline document. And you don't have to have something as official as that, but what I would say is for my smaller creators out there, if you have some logo work done or you had some colors chosen for you, I want you to save those on a document somewhere so that way you can reference them. So what I do whenever I'm not sure or I don't remember like how blue Joe's blue is or what font is the font that's used for his logo, I can pull that up and reference it. And it's also really useful for sizing and positioning things because a good brand guideline will tell you um, where to place your mark, wh um, where are the appropriate locations to place your logo mark, um, etc. So I don't normally use it when I'm doing his gameplay edits because um, I, am, I use a little more fun of a text for like subtitles or something like that. But for this video, I wasn't sure how to do this section breakdown and I wasn't sure what font to use or what colors. So I decide to reference that to just say, okay, what is Joe normally use for his branding? And that's what I did. If, um, when you're working on your videos and you're trying to establish like an identity for your content, um, coming up with like a, a text style or like an animation style or some kind of look for your font in general is a good idea because it makes your videos a little more recognizable. For instance, if you have a, uh, I don't know, if the colors you normally use are purple, you could use purple text with a black shadow or have purple text with a flicker on it or some wobble to it. And um, over time, people will begin to recognize that, oh, that's that's your video, like that's your clip. It's just, an, it's another like subtle thing to 
kind of help separate your videos from the rest. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm trying to play with different ways to incorporate those colors. I actually, I don't use this, but I feel like I should have. I kind of like that. The light blue shadow. Yeah, Brandon, what are we doing? So I go with the, the light blue outline. I feel like I should have just gone with the blue shadow. Yeah, I should have just gone with the blue shadow. I don't know. Doesn't matter all that much. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't do that. Sorry, I was just <laughs> looking at it, trying to see why I went with this one over the other. I uh, decided to put things in all caps because I, for some reason, I feel like words in all caps just look better. I had um, in junior high, this shop teacher, I believe it was metals. Yeah, I believe it was a metals class I had in junior high. But he wrote in all caps and he had said that the reason he did it was, oh, why did he say he did it? I can't remember, but he said he started writing in all caps um, once he started to get into his field. And ever since then, that's all he's ever written in. I always felt it looked so clean. And there was like a, a period of time where I tried it writing in all caps because my handwriting is just awful. And I just, it's so slow. Like, I don't know if anybody's tried writing in all caps, but man, it's not quick. But yeah, it's a crutch that I use. If ever I feel like something doesn't look great, I like to just capitalize everything. Just makes it makes it easier for, for me. So looks like I'm resizing the text. Um, and what I do here is, do I use uh, Shadow the Transform node, man? I've been riot relying on it heavily recently. We gotta switch things up soon. Uh, I have the text whip on screen, and this is what I was talking about with having your your image slide on screen. So I jump fo forward a couple of frames, and then I keyframe the position, and then I jump back to the beginning and keyframe it, and then at the beginning, I will slide that off the screen. So you can see I'm moving it off screen at the beginning, and what that animation creates is off screen at frame one, on screen six, seven frames later. And if you add the motion blur, it looks like it's kind of whipping into frame. So that's what I do there. And I think we're getting close to me doing the some of the sound design work. I think I'm just trying to get through this opening sequence. And actually, I feel like that looks pretty decent. Nice work, Brandon. Ooh, so we're a little half hour little half hour check in with you guys. Hopefully everybody's doing okay. I always underestimate how time consuming this process is when it comes to uh, doing the unedited edit or not time consuming, um, exhausting. Like I, I've watched it back a couple of times now, me doing these and I realize I, I think it's good for me to take some breaks sometimes because I'm, I feel like I'm just, non-stop just like yelling in your guys' ears about and then I did this and then I did the position and whew. so I'm taking a little half hour breather okay got some water in me you see that little pink rectangle I just well okay hopefully I put out the tutorial by the time this video goes live. But that is the transition that I do a tutorial on and it's a custom, custom, quote unquote custom, whip transition. And I have this transition saved in my power bins to use at any point. And I talk about it in that video, but power bins are really useful because they're a way for you to save presets, essentially, in DaVinci Resolve. Fun fact, if you set up a text file in DaVinci, you can actually drag that text file. So say I set it up to work exactly how I would like it to work, you can drag that into your media pool and then you can drag it back later. So it doesn't have to be in a power bin, but in like one working project, if you have something that you've set up and you really like how the way it looks and it could be, it's, it could be any file. So it could be like 
an audio file with the plugins and EQ that you'd like or a video with the um, the right animation settings, you can drag that into your media pool and it will save that file with those settings so that you can drag and drop it in later at any point to reference. So kind of cool. Power bins are a way to do that across any project and they have smart bins as well. And I think what smart bins are set up for are to reference or, or for you to reference a folder in any project. So say you have a folder set up on your PC for specifically for music that you like to use in your videos. Well, you can set up a smart bin, different than power bin, that will have that folder saved in your media pool. And then anytime you wanna use it, you can click on that folder and it'll bring up your entire library of music. So pretty useful. I, I typically use my Windows Explorer just because I find it to be faster doing that. But power bins, are really nice because if I set up a transition or I set up a camera shake or I set up some light rays or like if I set up an effect and I want to use that effect or transition later on, I can simply drag it into my power bin and then at any point in a different project, I can place it back in and it'll work exactly how I set it up and with all the settings that I like to set up. That is one gripe I have with DaVinci that I think Premiere, and I don't I don't know as many people who use Final Cut, but it seems like Premiere has a really easy way of setting up transitions and presets for you to load into your program. DaVinci has those, but it just seems a little more convoluted in order to get them and to work properly, especially on the edit page. In the Fusion page, it's it's pretty straightforward. You can set up your your node structure and then reuse it anywhere. But in the edit page, it's for some reason it's a little more finicky. Um, so right now I am overlaying his webcam onto the gameplay. There are certain sections where I don't do that, but there's parts where he's talking about something, and. It, it doesn't line up with his, the like the way his camera looks in the gameplay. You know, like it looks like I think there's parts where his camera in the gameplay he's he's saying something as well, and it can get a little confusing for a viewer to be like, wait, that's not what his his mouth isn't moving like that. Why? What's going on? So those are normally times where I do that. Uh, here I bring in a clip from console gameplay. Shout out my console gamers. Joe's talking about how, uh, yeah, he's talking about how console is basically unplayable for Caldera, at least at the, uh, the beginning part of the game. So I couldn't find anything that Joe had that was like broken or glitchy in my backup. So I found a YouTube video where this guy, excuse me, this person was, uh, he had put together a compilation of uh, <laughs> console clips and console moments. So I found a good one where he goes through the map and we end up using that in the video. And it still looks like I'm going through the, the bulk of the edit in my head, yeah, I I know for sure that I wanted to really get the feel and um, I guess the overall structure of the video done before I do the sound design and before I move on to different parts. Once you have things positioned correctly and you have your keyframe set up to a point where you can like copy and paste those settings, which is what you should do, if you've ever set something up once, you should never have to do it again. It's like there's like a similar similar mantra with coding, you know, like if there's <laughs> there's ever something you have to do more than once, like there's probably a loop for that. Same with editing. Like if there's ever something that you do once in a project, you should never have to like redo that. So I think what I'm trying to do is get to a point to where I feel like I've done all the things that I need to do for this video. Once we get past the intro, the rest of the video is gonna be Joe talking. And this might be one of the last things I set up is this text. And so this is like the, the common text that I use. It's, um, I believe the font is called New York. And I have a, a black 
outline on it in black shadow uh and that's what i normally use or i've been using for subtitles and i, I kind of like the way it looks all right so i'm skipping a little bit uh forward in the edit because uh this next section is I think one of the last animations I do, and then we go into the sound design, which is something I, I keep talking about. So I'm gonna talk about this um, quickly. There's, uh, in this section of the video, Joe is talking about how one of the problems with the, oh, and there is my doggy, Miss Sadie. Uh, <laughs> she has found her voice recently and she sure loves to bark. But he's talking about how one of the problems in the map is that Everything funnels or starts at the, the middle of the map and then funnels out instead of kind of being evenly dispersed. So what I'm going to do to illustrate that is I'm going to have this picture of the map slide onto the screen, add a little drop shadow to it to give it some 3D-ishness. And the options I had here were to hand animate some arrows pointing to the center of the map and then pointing out or... I could bring in some some uh, arrows from story blocks, which is what I end up doing. So uh, right here, instead of just having it slide on screen, I'm trying to have it uh, kind of bounce on so you can see it goes up and then down. And I think I needed to, now that I'm looking back at it, I don't know if I do this or not. Yeah, it doesn't look like I do. I needed to extend out those keyframes uh, just because the animation haps, happens too fast, like you can't really see it slide up and down, so it doesn't give it that um, that whiplashing effect. And the next thing that I do is I'm keyframing it, zooming in on the center of the map, right? Because we're talking about the center of the map. I drop in my grid, which is another thing that I have saved to my power bins, um, so that I can use it across any project to size this, and it doesn't it doesn't work how I'd like it to work because I'd like it to zoom in and then crop the outside and the speed at which it crops doesn't match the speed at which it zooms in. And I think what I could have done to fix that is to bring it into the fusion page, but it didn't seem like it was that big of a deal for what we got going on. So here I'm looking for some arrows and I have a couple saved in my folders. Um, some of them are static. These look like they're animated ones, and uh, I remember looking through those and thinking it's not really what I want. Like I want something like pointing towards the middle, not kind of like wiping across the screen. So um, I remember here I go into story blocks and I look for some arrow packs that I end up bringing on. Um, something that I do here that why isn't it? Oh, because I think I have it on the the wrong clip. That's why it's not working. Uh, one thing that I do whenever I bring on an image video graphic on screen so that it's on top of another video layer, a lot of times what I'll do is I will blur out the background so that it's really easy to focus what's, Focus on what's happening in the foreground. So that's what I do there. I drop in a Gaussian blur. It's not Gaussian or uh, Ga Gaussian. It's Gaussian. It's Gaussian blur. We got to respect our mathematicians out there. So here, yeah, here's where I'm going to story blocks and um, I'm gonna bring in the arrows. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna skip ahead a little bit in the edit. Uh, I'm gonna let the little arrow sequence play through in the background for just a second. But essentially what I do is I bring in these arrows and I overlay them on top of the map so that they're pointing inwards towards the middle when Joe was talking about people flying in. And then I flip them around when he's talking about people leaving. But I think for the the next couple sections of this video, I'm just editing the B-roll, which I don't think is going to be as useful for you guys um, compared to me talking about the sound design a little bit and some of the things that I learned. So I'm going to go ahead and skip forward to that. All right, here we go. So um, you can hear that song in the background. Right now I'm looking for uh, opening track and some sound effects to go with some of the animations. In general, I, what I do use are these whooshes, these whooshes for any time that something slides on screen. 
Um, I think it was, is it Finzar? Oh, I probably just butchered that channel's name. I'm so sorry. He's a really talented editor and he's got some videos that help with um, figuring out editing practices. But one of the things he says and a lot of people say is in YouTube land, when things move, you want them to sound like they're moving through like some really thick air, like some really dense thick air. So anytime there's like uh, a really quick movement, emphasizing that with a whoosh is helpful. And one of the things that I don't do well at the beginning part and that I go back and correct for the actual video is I make my sound effects way too loud in here. Like I said earlier, I watched that video on um, Standard Story Company and how he went through his sand, sound design. So I wanted to really emphasize doing that kind of work through this intro. And the mistake that I made was making my sound effects way too loud. If it's something that should be prominent, make it prominent. But if you're just trying to accent a particular event, then um, having the dB level at zero is not a good idea. Well, I, I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. I don't think it is. So I've, I set up some of the whooshes and I've got my intro track and I end up swapping out the intro a few times um, just because it didn't it didn't quite fit the energy that I would like like Joe is talking about you know like the talk let's have the talk and it's supposed to be kind of like a lighthearted fun moment that I wanted to then carry into his spiel about talking about war zone one versus war zone two which is a little more serious and needed a little bit more um, energy going into that section. So in my head, what I'm thinking right now, and I don't remember if this is what I do, but what I should have, what I should do, and maybe I, I do do it, is I should start with a light, fun opening intro track and then transition to something with a little more funk or um, percussion or something to speed through the rest of the intro. Uh, <laughs> what did I just look up? There's children something. So this is one of those sections I'm talking about. Like I, I want to emphasize this, um, this therapy scene with the sound. So I'm looking for, uh, I think I look for like bee buzzing and birds chirping and then like a random noise from uh, a child to like sell that quick little scene. And fun fact, actually, well, it's kind of just fun for me. Did you know that Walla, W-A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, is what it's called? when you use, or it's like the genre of sounds, of human noises that are incomprehensible. So like crowd noises or audience noises, where it sounds like a crowd or an audience or a person, but they're not actually saying words. It's voila, voila. It's kind of a fun word. I learned that the other day. So whenever you're looking for people noises, maybe maybe do a search for Walla. Walla. Oh, there we go. Now I got my birds chirping. What's the... I'm trying to figure out what the other noises are. Maybe it's Joe talking? I don't know. Okay, so I got my birds chirps. And then, yeah, I'm looking for my bee buzzing. I layer the, the bird chirps... Uh, an increasing audio. That was a cool trick that I had learned um, from the standard story company. He mentioned talk, or he mentioned that if you are ever going to repeat a sound, so like say, I think the example he uses was a camera shutter. So if you're going through a sequence where you're using that camera shutter over, right? So like it's a quick image overlay sequence where it's showing like a bunch of different pictures and you use the the camera flash or shutter to um, 
emphasize that. If you either change the pitch or like increase or decrease the volume, it um, you can add to like the heightening or building of the sequence without it sounding like you've just used the same sound bite over and over and over again. So I tried that with the bird chirps. Um, I remember while I was editing it, editing it, I was not a huge fan of the way it sounds. And I don't remember if I end up keeping it or not. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I really don't. But those are there. Um, another thing that he did in his effects a lot that I didn't do in mine is he adds reverb to a lot of his effects and he uses a preset in Premiere that sounds pretty good and I'm going to have to go back and watch it but when I tried using that and I played around with the preset a little bit it just did not it just did not sound great so I tried it here and there but overall it just I don't know just didn't work how I like it to. Oh, so I do. I do, I do use two music tracks. So you can see I have this uh, second music track that I bring in for like the talking sequence, which is good. Nice work, Brandon. Way to go, man. And I'm continuing to add the, uh, the whooshes. At this point, they're still way too loud. They're still way louder than they need to be. And... I spend a good chunk of time going through this because I'm learning and I'm trying to figure figure out what I should start using and what I shouldn't use. So that one I just dropped in was a bass drop. I uh, use it to emphasize the closing statement that he had. I think he says, oh, it's... No, not that talk, the war zone talk. And I think that's where I have the bass drop. I have a, a folder saved on my computer. And I'm not sure if that was the one actually up in the background, but uh, it's like my sound effects is for impacts. So I have bass drops and thuds and that sort of thing. And those are useful for punctuating things or transitioning or when there's like a sudden... Uh, surprise moment. Those are really useful. And what am I doing? Oh, pan. I have a frying pan. <laughs> so I think <laughs> this happened to be a happy accident. And I don't know if it ends up working out all that great. Because when I, when I play back the video now, it sounds a little off. Uh, but... I was looking for, in that sequence, like a panning whoosh, you know, like panning from left to right, because Joe moves from left to right. And instead, what came up in Epidemic was an actual frying pan. And I was like, oh, that's kind of fun. So <laughs> that's what I use. Got a nice little dung that I drop in there. Oh, yeah, another whoosh. And I think this is where I tried doing the reverb thing. So I have the one pan noise and I, I duplicate it for the, the second cut of the effect. And then I'm going to layer it with the exact same noise, but with reverb to give it, to give it a little more richness, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I guess it's, I don't know if it matters all that much, but I'm trying, man. I'm trying to figure out these, these, this sound effects. I do. Oh, gong. Do I bring in a gong? Is that what I do? I thought it was a pan. A pan. Is it a gong? No. Yeah. See, I go back to the frying pan. Shout out frying pans, man. Love a good frying pan. Yeah, see? <laughs> uh, I guess it is kind of a funny effect. I don't know. Listen, it's not perfect. We're just we're trying to figure it out as we go along. Um, it is a noticeable difference, though, when you include things like these and when you don't. 
it's something that I like to incorporate into the gameplays instead of doing like a, a video cutaway. What I mean by that is, say there's a funny moment in the gameplay, a lot of times what people will do, will they'll, they will then cut to like, a, I don't know, some kind of meme. So it's like SpongeBob meme or like an old vine or something like that. And it completely cuts away from the gameplay to show that meme. Sometimes it's really f funny and when it's well done and it's well timed, it works really well, but I prefer to just use the audio. And um, the reason I do that is because for Joe's gameplay and for other people's gameplays, where the focus is on the gameplay itself, it's not necessarily a highlight video. Like we're not we're not jumping from different points in a stream or his gameplay, uh, it's not a compilation, but we're focused on the gameplay itself. When you cut away to something like that, I think it really takes away from the gameplay. And if I would say it's hard to do them well. Like when you're coming up with your own original funny template or your own clip that you've gone out and find and it's not like the exact same i don't know like vine that people have been using for the last 20 years it works well but when you go and you do the cliche thing a lot of times it just comes off as like super cheesy and hokey hokey can i use that super cheesy and hokey I guess back to this edit, I've added in a couple different music tracks and you can see them on that, or is that audio track five? And I have them blending into each other. Oh, here's a cool thing. So here's me trying to remember how to do something because I don't always remember. Um, the video I'm watching is a tutorial on how to do a low pass filter. And what a low pass filter does technically is it muffles and mutes or lowers the volume of things in higher frequencies. So those are like, um, those are gonna be like your high frequency buzzes and like dings and you know, like the noise a mosquito makes, like those are your high frequency noises. And then your low frequency noises are gonna be your more uh, bassy things like, um, like I, I don't know, bass. <laughs> <laughs> like the you know that vibration you hear from uh, a car from miles away you know that like boom boom, boom. those are your low frequency noises so a low pass filter allows the low frequency noises in and a high pass filter will allow high high frequency noises in and um when you use a low pass filter in your eq which is what i did it tends to muffle the noise and almost give it like an underwater-ish sounding effect. And it makes it sound more distant than if you don't include it. So if you don't, like if you're, if you feel like a certain sound or um, audio track is just kind of like overwhelming the noise that should be playing in the foreground. Sometimes using a low pass filter is a good solution. And that is another thing I picked up from, I don't know if it was Standard Story Company, but somebody else gave me that little tidbit of knowledge and it's a useful one. But yeah, if you're like, if you're trying to um, make something sound like it's fading out and you know how they have that like cinema effect where like the grenade goes off and all of a sudden, everybody's hearing is bad. They, nobody can hear anything anymore. Well, the low pass filter will make your uh, your voice give that kind of like faded, distant feeling. Uh, I think I'm fixing my mask here because it wasn't working correctly. So I had to go into my compound clip and fix it. If you want to add a low pass filter, that video is four minutes long. It'll tell you how to do it. Essentially what you do is in your EQ, in DaVinci Resolve at least, um, not in the Fairlight page, in the edit page. You could do it in the Fairlight page as well. 
you go to your EQ, you turn on band one, and you swap it to the fork that's pointing to the left, and you pull it up so that the the bar graph is raised and up to the left, and then you turn on band four, and you do the fork that points to the right. Hopefully I said that correctly, and you drag that down. So essentially you form this S where the blue graph is up to the left and down to the right. And there you go. Shout out low pass filters. Shout out to whoever I'm talking to as well because I'm sending some kind of message. Okay, and I, I think what I'm doing right here now is I've got a better idea of how the whoosh volume should sound. So I'm going back through the edits that I made and I'm adding them in. Um, that that pink box was that transition that we made earlier. So I, I added a sound effect to the transition. And uh, I think there's a lot of times where you can see, I don't know if I talked about it earlier or not. I don't think so. Uh, I've overlaid Joe's webcam over the gameplay, right? And so in that animation, you can see it zooming down to the gameplay. Uh, I added a, a whoosh there as well. Oh, it looks like I did cut out the camera tracking bit. So the, uh, there's that section right there that I keep showing where it's animating the logos. The way I did that is I, I went into the Fusion page and added a planar tracker to track the logos. Wow. We are already an hour in. That is crazy, man. Time flies when we're just editing. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? I guess what I'll say about doing the sound design, so um, to close it off, is in the YouTube space, sometimes I think it's better to use a sound effect for... Or, I guess I shouldn't say use a sound effect, but if you can over accentuate certain things that are happening, it'll add a lot of value to your video that people probably won't comment about, but you'll notice it's lacking. It's one of those things where you don't notice it until it's gone. So when you watch a bigger YouTuber who has good production value to their videos, Next time you watch it, take a like listen to what's happening in the background when they cut to certain things or when they're talking about certain things. So like, you know, if it's like a, a documentary style video, when they're um, bringing up evidence on screen to show something like what kind of noise is in the background? What kind of music do they use? Um, it, the more I'm watching those kind of videos, the more I'm learning what these really talented editors are doing to emphasize their points. So um, that's what I'm trying to do through this section. And I think I delete some of the sound effects because they're overbearing. Uh, while the arrows are coming in, I add like a digital noise, like a very soft digital noise so that they're not just um, flying in. I think the last thing I'll say about the sound design is don't make them too loud until you're really comfortable with how they sound because that is something else that will stand out in your video is if your effects and audio design including music come in way too loud it will ruin the video so i would generally say be safe and make it quieter if you're not sure how it's going to sound and then you can always bring it up later you know <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Now, the biggest change that made me so, um, is I, that's, I think that's going to cover most of the things that I wanted to talk about with this video. If there's any questions about something in particular, be, feel free to ask it uh, in the comments, and I will be happy to go over anything. But what I'm going to do for the rest of this edit is play through Joe's talking points, add any B-roll, so like you can see right now he's talking and I have gameplay in the background, cut back to his webcam when it's something that I feel is um, more important to just focus on what Joe's saying. Oh, here's a useful website. There's um, 
is it just called call of duty maps.com i think it's yeah call of duty maps.com you can get any screenshot from any map in any call of duty yeah like any of the call of duties and there are high-res screenshots so it's a useful thing useful thing to know um but I think I'm going to call the video there. Um, in the future, if anybody makes it this far and is kind of hoping to see the rest of the edit, let me know and I can let the back half of the edit play all the way through. But I've covered most of the things that I feel like are relevant. And if there's anything you'd like to see me do in the future, let me know as well. I am normally pretty good about reading what you all are saying and uh, trying to get back to everybody. So I appreciate you guys. Um, and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.